What's up everybody, it's the EV engineer here and today I'm going to be talking all about CAN communication. What it is, why we care, and how it works. So what is CAN communication? CAN communication is a protocol that is used extensively in the automotive industry everywhere from internal combustion vehicles to electric vehicles to robotics. And the reason it is so widespread is because it is a fast and reliable protocol which is very important for safety critical applications. The CAN protocol is used between ECUs in these vehicles. So an ECU is an electronic control unit, or pretty much uh, you can think of it as a microcontroller. So you have ECUs spread out all across the vehicle. You might have one on the high voltage battery. You might have another one controlling the windows. You'll have another one uh, controlling you know, the motors of the vehicle, and they all need to communicate with each other. And the way they do this is through this embedded protocol called CAN. So what does a CAN bus look like, or what is a CAN bus? So CAN is a shared bus topology. So what that means is there is no master device. There are a bunch of distributed CAN nodes that are all able to communicate with each other over this shared bus. Now this shared bus happens to be a pair of differential signal lines or wires. And these are usually twisted together because a twisted pair of wires is less prone to electromagnetic interference. And the reason for this is imagine you have a wire and you have some sort of interference that distorts the signal. Well, if you have two wires and you have a distortion, it distorts both wires by the same amount. And as I'll explain later, can a CAN signal is actually the difference between these two wires. So if both wires are distorted to the same degree, then it doesn't actually affect the CAN signal. That's what makes CAN so uh, reliable in the first place. So as I've shown here, we have all the CAN nodes on the shared bus. And the shared bus itself, uh, like I mentioned, is just two cables, and these have what are called terminating resistors on each end of the bus. Pretty much the idea is that when you have a transmission line and you have a signal going on the transmission line, it can reflect off the end of the transmission line and you want to pick uh, resistor values to reduce um, this reflection as much as possible. So that's why uh, these terminating resistors are very important on a CAN bus. Now you might be wondering, okay, we have a bunch of nodes on a bus. How do we prevent them from talking over each other? Well, that's where we enter uh, CAN message arbitration. So each node on a CAN bus has an ID. And every time a CAN node wants to send a message, it will first transmit its ID onto the bus. Now, something very important about the CAN protocol is that a zero bit overpowers a one bit. So if you have two nodes and they both want access to the bus, they're both going to start by transmitting their IDs. Now, since a zero overpowers a one bit, the CAN node that has a lower ID will always overpower the CAN node with a higher ID. So that means lower ID is higher priority. So for example, let's say you have a node that has ID 15, and you have another node with ID 16. They're both going to start their transmissions. And by the time they get to bit 4, that is when their IDs will start to become different. And the node 15, because it is Low, smaller than 16, will have a zero here and overpower the 16. So an important feature of the CAN bus, first of all, is that every node um, can try to transmit onto the bus, but they will only be able to if they win the CAN message arbitration. And the way that they know that they've won the CAN message arbitration is if the, the ID that they transmit, their own ID, is read back successfully. So each node can transmit and read their own transmissions on the bus. 
So they know that they've successfully obtained access to the bus if they can read back their own ID, pretty much. So as you can see in the case of node 16 here, it fails. So it stops its own transmission and it will wait until node 15 is done and then it'll try again. And that is pretty much the gist of it. That is how you have a bunch of nodes on a shared bus um, making sure they don't step over each other. So what does a CAN signal actually look like? So the CAN protocol operates on the physical layer and the data link layer of the OSI model. So the file layer, the physical layer, is, is as low as it gets. It just concerns with voltage levels. So the CAN signal voltage level specification is as follows. You have two wires, as I mentioned before. We'll call one of them CAN high and the other CAN low for obvious reasons. Now, it is the difference between these two wires that uh, determine whether or not a bit is a zero or a one. Now, there are different types of CAN standards, but the most common one that you'll come across is CAN high speed. And that says that if there are two volts between CAN high and CAN low, that is a dominant uh, voltage. So that'll be a bit zero. If there is uh, no difference or very small difference between CAN high and CAN low, um, we say that the lines are at a recessive voltage and that is a one. And that's pretty much it, really. So moving on, we have the data link layer of the protocol. So one step above physical. Now the data link layer is concerned with what data is actually sent over these lines. Um, and so the CAN signal has 64 bits of data and it has a whole bunch of other metadata involved. By the way, I found this uh, diagram on Wikipedia and I highly recommend that if you're interested in CAN that you go read this Wikipedia page. It goes into extreme detail. I'll keep things at a bit of a higher level. I won't go into every single bit here, but I'll cover the important stuff. So. A CAN transmission will start with the SOF bit or start of frame. Uh, so we can see here we have the CAN high and CAN low. We also have CAN RX. Uh, so the CAN RX line is what, is what goes into a microcontroller. So you can just think of this as the data. So we start off our transmission uh, in the idle state, or I guess before we start our transmission, the bus is in the idle state. And then we go to a dominant voltage, which as we know is a zero for one bit. And that indicates that we are now beginning a transmission. We now have the arbitration phase. So as we talked about earlier, there could be several CAN nodes that want to transmit something at the same time. So this sequence of bits will just determine which CAN node will actually get access to the bus. These stuff bits here are pretty interesting. So the stuff bit pretty much is like a heartbeat. It just checks that there are no issues on the CAN bus. Because you can imagine there might be like a short circuit on CAN high or CAN low. And if, it, if it's just constantly held at one, then there might be an issue. But the stuff bit just interrupts this pattern and just says, OK, yeah, everything's fine. Continue on. So you can pretty much just ignore the stuff bit. So moving on, after the CAN node gets access to the bus, it will send the DLC. So a DLC stands for data length code. And this pretty much just says, hey, my message has this many bytes. Because even though we have 64 bits of data available in the CAN frame, we might only have 3 bits of data, or 13 bits, or 21 bits. We don't necessarily need to use all 64 bits. So the DLC just says, you can expect this much data. Then we send the data, and another stuff bit. After all the data is sent, we send something called a CRC. And a CRC is a cyclic redundancy check. And it's pretty much just a uh, sort of cryptographic um, function of our data, of our CAN frame, to uh, make sure that there are no uh, corruptions in the data. Uh, we then have the ACK bits. So the ACK bits will be um, acknowledged from the receiver. So the transmitter will see the ACK bits and will say, OK, cool, the receiver got my message. And then we have the end of frame bits. 
So these are a recessive voltage. So pretty much like the bus will just go back to idle for a certain amount of bits. And then there are the interframe spacing bits. And this is just uh, three bits to just make sure that there is a bit of space between the CAN frames uh, on the CAN bus. So now we have a pretty good idea of what the actual CAN bus and protocol looks like. Uh, so what does the CAN node look like? Well, the CAN node is usually just a microcontroller that has a CAN controller. And the CAN controller is what handles the data link, data link layer of the protocol. Uh, so it'll handle like the, the CAN frames, um, you know, figuring out which ID it is, that sort of thing. And then we have the CAN transceiver, which is the phi layer of the protocol. Uh, and usually uh, microcontrollers don't actually have CAN transceivers. You need to buy an external device. Uh, but most microcontrollers do have the CAN controller. So we can see the diagram here. We have CAN high, CAN low. These will go into the CAN transceiver, which then passes those on to the CAN controller. The CAN controller will do uh, like CAN message arbitration. It'll detect errors. Uh, just implement uh, the basic functionality of the protocol. And then we have our microcontroller, which will then consume the data. That pretty much covers the basics of CAN. So there's a lot more to this protocol to know, uh, such as like a CAN airframe, uh, there's fault tolerant, low speed CAN, there's CAN FD. CAN FD is just really fast CAN, it's pretty new. There's acceptance filters. Acceptance filters are pretty much uh, just a way for a CAN node to ignore data it doesn't care about. I'll leave some links in the description for further reading. And uh, I've got some more videos coming soon where I might go into more detail about some of these topics. But we've pretty much covered like the basics of CAN. So if you liked the video, please drop a like and subscribe and stay tuned. I've got a few more videos coming out about uh, embedded protocols and I'll be coding some on the ESP32.